I'm Delia Robinson and I'm welcoming you to a studio visit. Please come on in. All right. I learned whistle making, which is where, what I do here, uh, from my mother. And there she is. She made small ethereal little birds and was always satisfied making those. This one has a very quiet voice, which is probably why I ended up with it. The children got the duds. Um, I've drifted a long way from the whistle making my mother taught me um, because over time I've used whistles as a platform for storytelling, which turns out to be this narrative interest has really been a major feature in my life, um, at least in regard to arts. Uh, I work with earthenware clay. It looks like this when it's raw, and I, I shape it over my thumb like this. I fire it when it's done in this kiln till it's red hot, and some of the whistles are tiny and made over my little finger, and some are huge and they're made over my fist, or, or, or I shape them with my hands in this way and, and combine many little pots like this together. Then I close this up and make it whistle. And the reason you don't run into whistle makers every minute is because that part is tricky. Uh, it has to be exactly, exactly right or it won't make a sound. And so I'll put the clay away so later I can finish something there. As every whistle I make is made one at a time and it's unique and nothing else is ever going to be like it. Even if I tried to make one like it, it wouldn't turn out to be like it. So that's my process, is working there. And I work with knitting needles, darning needles, things that my mother worked with. For her tools, I also still work with to this day. Uh, and I, whistle makers tend to have the few that exist on the planet still. And it is an ancient craft and used to be as common as quilt making in our culture. But it's it now, it's really just there's some sort of outliers still making it. I'm also an unschooled painter, and whistles often creep into my pictures. Uh, the paintings behind me, I painted them as milestones for whistles that had changed the way I worked. And the first one of them is a tiny little one that doesn't show from a distance, but up close, there's a, a little ocarina, a little meaning little goose, that is the, t the traditional Italian shape for, whist for a whistle. And he sounds like that. And I've put on his back a little girl. And this isn't the whistle I made decades ago when I broke away from making the birds I was taught. But this whistle is very like what happened. I realized if I put a little berry in his mouth or a little frog on his back or a little passenger and she sings, that it, I've I've entered into a different realm. I'm telling stories now with it. And they become enormously elaborate and uh, sometimes laughably so. And, you know, these stacks of ones where it's the three wise men sleeping. The angel wakens them up saying, go to the star. The star's down here on the lower stack. And they are marching off to go follow the star. To, and, the, and the Christmas story, and there's a landscape under them the way it is on this. These people are dancing on a landscape of little houses, completely unaware that they are because they're crazy about each other. But this sort of thing, when I make these stacks, everything whistles. I've reached the point where I hardly make anything on a whistle, on a big whistle that doesn't have another voice, uh, extra voices. And that has just been the wonderful madness of making these and how fun it, it grows into something bigger and bigger. On the shelves up here, um, there are whistles about story songs, which have been major in my life. These whistles were made for a book, and that hasn't happened as back. Things have gotten very quiet since the pandemic. This is the, and each one tells a story of, of some, some old ballad that that came to America and then changed very, very much when it arrived here. This is Maddie Groves, 
and he has this woman rushing him. Her husband's coming in. She's torn his clothes away, and she's after him. Poor little boy. And the husband comes in and has, wants to duel with him. Here's a favorite of mine. Little Margaret sitting on her high hall door, combing her long yaller hair. They sang that when I was a child. And here she is in another version where she's coming in as a ghost in terror to, to the man who has betrayed her. And there, all these whistles are, are tell in the story that was in the old days. This was a story about a knight who killed a giant boar, and he saved a naked lady from a tree, and he killed a giant and an old witch. And he was really Mr. Daring Do. And now it's a popular banjo tune in America. And the song that goes with it is Old Bangum. And Old Bangum goes to the woods and he kills a pig. And that's it. It's a big pig, but the chorus has remained the same since medieval times. And that's Old Bangum. He did ride a sword and pistol by his side. All of the pistols been obviously added later. But anyway, that's what these are all about. And uh, hopefully, Things will get back on the on the road to making this book. Otherwise, I'm going to have to have a fire sale of ballad whistles. And uh, up here is what I'm working on currently, and that is playing around with the idea of a of a painting, which is filled with these little women with chickens on their heads. I'm playing with this idea that this 2D flat painting has a 3D element of of elements of the painting are emerging out into our space. And that's what I'm doing now. And this sort of stuff is all painted upstairs, so we should go now up the stairs to the top of the house. Now we're at the top, and that's my painting room. And I initially was just going to have it be a studio, but it became also the place where I sleep. Uh, and over in the far corner, there's a very small area for, that's a, for writing. And then uh, there's where I sleep, and I, the, that area has been separated off from the real world with a, some very large paintings that were on their way to the dump when I moved here to, from my big old house in the country. And, uh, and then I came here, spent one night, and felt like I was in a fishbowl. And so I went back and got those paintings and set them up as a wall. And I'm so glad I did, because at night, I'd never had street lights before. I've always been rural, and, and the shadow from the street lights made by these towns is absolutely beautiful and magic. And so, um, I, the, and those paintings were made for an art show about puppet, small theater. So these were puppet stages. And it's nice that in my life that's become such a, it always was an important part. I mean, we were, when we were children, we had puppet shows going on nonstop. With the, but uh, here's what happened. I used to have a sort of a phobia almost about painting, putting paint on a clean surface. I had to mess that surface up. So I'd glue stuff all over it. And it would build up all this rough layers. It was like a kind of broken linoleum eventually. And when, and you could see through different layers because of glazes and stuff and have all this narrative information that may or may not tell you anything. And I would be very pleased with that when it got very complicated and strange. And when the pandemic started, I was at a point of a transition where I was taking those old pictures, like this one, which is all ripped and scratched and layers and layers and layers of images, and I would paint on it a new picture that was clear and direct. And this is a the woman who married a bear. And that is based on the story my children came home from school telling about a local man who went bear hunting in Maine and came home with a wife. And my children insisted that he had married a bear. And uh, I was never telling them no, they were sure. And this is just one painting of that story. But out of it came many, many, many whistles of all sizes of the woman who married a bear. It's a theme I like very much. And um, so, and other ones that I've painted during this time are old ladies having tea. And the room behind them is one of these strange sort of metamorphic interiors that I would have painted then. But now they're sitting there having their tea. And it is a statement about what it's like trying to live a life in COVID when everything is under transition. I paint the things that I missed. I paint the things that I'm interested in. Here's a, a painting of a, of a myth. This is Daphne. It's a very scary painting. This is Daphne running from Apollo. 
She asks her father to save her from this man who has very bad intentions, and her father turns her into a tree. So she's turning into a tree here, and Apollo, who has not caught her, takes out his phone and snaps a selfie. And he is the selfie guy who ends up in many of my paintings. There'll be monumental events going on that are earth shattering, and he's there taking a selfie. During the pandemic, food became very important. A lot of time was spent thinking about food and preparing meals. And I would paint the meals that I particularly liked. Here is tortilla pie. I love it. Up here are the ingredients. So this is tortillas, olives, peppers, garlic, salt and pepper, onion, tomatoes, cheese, lots of cheese, corn, and beans of various in various forms, and a little olive oil. And here's what you need to make it. Those are your utensils. And here's the finished product and a spoon and a little plate over here to serve it. And I painted a number of these recipe things. I didn't go so far as tuna pea wiggle, but it got that silly. But my favorite of all of them was is called egg over cheesy. And it shows my breakfast that I eat every morning. And it's cheddar cheese from Cabot with, an, uh, with a fried egg. And so the egg over cheesy painting and this typified a real transition. I wasn't messing up the canvas anymore. I was painting it directly on it and trying to make a clear image. And out of that, I painted many dreams. One of a nursing home that I dreamed about where all the old people were having a nursing home in the forest. And they were all up in the tree branches, sitting on branches, comfortably having their tea and coffee. And a man running up a ladder to refill their cups. And I absolutely adored that painting. And the other of a of just the of the bare backside of something that seems to be an angel because it has huge wings at the bottom. It's coming into the painting from high, on high to land on a horse's back. Now I have no data about angels, but I do love that concept of the of the two upper limbs and the flying beneficent being that's just really charming to me and so they end up in my pictures quite a bit where did this idea of this clean straight image come from this is very obviously not my <laughs> mode of working in the past and even now it's it's a surprise to me and it came from making crankies and i will now take you downstairs where i will tell you about crankies in the main room and give you a cranky show because because of crankies i've been asked to do this in the first place so come on and let's go downstairs this is a cranky and a cranky is a pre-industrial viewing device so that you can watch a movie before movies were invented there's a long scroll of paper in this one. People use silk or whatever they ha have that is in a long strip. And uh, paint, it has a painted picture on it that you can crank through and the picture's in a narrative form. So as you go through, you get a story. And you have no doubt guessed that ballads and story songs have been very important in my life because of all the whistles and the paintings I've done on them. And this turns out to be a very good way to present a ballad to people who aren't used to that kind of format of music. And I grew up in a time and in a place where ballads were still valued in our community and music was very common. And so I have known many ballads my entire life. And uh, this, uh, the, crank, the cranky thing, the name cranky is uh, coined by Peter Schumann. Uh, he brought back into common use cr the, this kind of device. Uh, it dates back to Middle Ages, maybe earlier, but there are no mentions of it into the Middle Ages, 1200 or round about there. It was a way that people would go to the market to earn money. They'd stand up on a bench and sing a song and then pass the hat. And they would have picture, a picture of scrolls or cardboard pictures, you know, pictures to hold up to illustrate their song and give them the edge over the other people who were just singing. And um, it was always a popular protest for protest theater. And finally, in Germany, the Nazis outlawed it because it was considered too dangerous for them to have people feeling they could go out in the street and put on theater that defamed their, their regime. So um, what's needed with this, 
you need a big, bold series of clear, colorful images. And clear is the main thing. People have to be able to tell from 30 feet away what the story, what's happening in that story. And um, you need a box with a viewing window and a way to pull the scroll through. And so this has got two cranks, and I will crank it, and it will pull the scroll through the theater as we go. I'm going to do a short ballad for you. Uh, it's a, I've chosen to paint a scroll to accompany this ballad. The ballad is called Wave the Ocean, Wave the Sea. And it's a story of love that has been lost. And it has this, the ballad grew out of a very old fiddle tune that is still, that's also called Wave the Ocean, that is still played in square dance halls today. And um, the chorus of the song is dominated by the words evoking the square dance maneuver called Wave the Ocean. And in that maneuver, a set, a, a set of eight people dancing in a square, how, in a series of, of swings and quarter turns, they reposition themselves into a line and move down the hall as a line. And so in wave, that maneuver is called Wave the Ocean, and it's also called Wave the Sea. So, and there's also a quilt pattern called Wave the Ocean, Wave the Sea, and maybe you slept under one last night. It's a very common quilt pattern and very beautiful. Now we're ready to do the cranky of Wave the Ocean, Wave the Sea, and we have Mark Greenberg here to play the banjo to accompany the ballad. <laughs> of the ocean shore. Her cheeks were red, her eyes were green, the prettiest girl I've ever seen. Wave the ocean, wave the sea, wave that pretty girl back to me. Wave the ocean, wave the sand, wave that girl and wave again. Or turn and swing. Call me to a far off land. Wave the ocean, wave the sea, wave that pretty girl back to me. Wave the ocean, wave the sand, wave and wave and wave again. Or turn and swing. Pretty girl back to me, wave the ocean, wave the sand, wave and wave and wave again, or turn and swing. Strand where the waves. 
waves come crashing upon the land. I'll take this ring made for my bride and throw it into the rolling tide. Wave the ocean, wave the sea, wave that pretty girl back to me. Wave the ocean, wave the sand, wave and wave and wave again. For turn and swing. 